Texas baseball heads into one of their biggest non-conference matchups, hot off a series win against Purdue. Kerwin Roach missed his first game this weekend due to a suspension. All this and more on College Crossfire. Guess we'll get yeah. Always enthusiastic, unbelievable, hard nose. All right, let me explain why Aaron Judge is getting it. You can boo me all you want. I knew Texas was going to win, <laughs> right? and then one of the Texas team was going to lose. Cannon. I don't like the cannon. Oh, wait, you don't like the cannon. This is all chaos. Welcome into College Crossfire. Thank you for being here with us tonight. I'm your host, Jonathan Pulasic. Let's go ahead and meet our panelists for tonight. We've got returning champ champion Matt Marinchak making just his third appearance on this show. Matt, how you feeling tonight? Great. Let's win another one. Let's get another one. We've got College Crossfire rookie Jake Herman. Jake, how you feeling ahead of your first show? I'm feeling good. I'm excited. It's great to be here and uh, ready to get a win. Ready to get a win. Great to have you tonight. And we've got another College Crossfire rookie, James Grant. James, how you feeling, Tom? Man, I'm feeling great. I'm ready to get off to a good start, too. Yeah, Everybody, me and Jake brought our A game. So. Brought your A game. That's what you're going to need tonight. So glad to have you all on tonight. Let's just jump on in. Texas baseball currently sits at 7-2 and two and won 3 out of 4 against a Purdue team that went to regionals last year. For the most part, Texas has been carried by stellar pitching and a red-hot offense. But what impressed you the most about this team this last weekend? Let's start with Matt. Well, overall, the team's played great, good pitching, good hitting. They have great defensive plays by Ryan Reynolds, um, Austin Todd, all of them. So overall, like you win three out of four games, but a lot of high-scoring games. They shut out Purdue in the last game. The only real worry was the like, second game on Saturday against Purdue because they were sloppy the whole game and then gave up the four. But... Overall, good weekend, and then yesterday they beat Sam Houston, and right now they're winning, so they're not going into LSU with a lot of momentum. Yeah, carrying a lot of momentum. Yeah, you did mention that second game of the doubleheader, a little bit underwhelming overall. Good pitching until the ninth inning, but it happens. Jake, what do you think? Yeah, uh, what's impressed me about this Texas team so far is the timely hitting. Um, I think this is a factor, this is a product of the fact that they have a really deep batting lineup this year. We've seen contributions from guys up and down the order. Um, it seemed like whenever Purdue would have a big inning, the Longhorns would be right there to respond. They had a great job getting big innings with the bottom of the order, able to turn that lineup over, which is something this team didn't quite have as much last year. Um, so you'd like to see the depth from Texas going forward, and uh, that's definitely a reason why they were able to come back and win even Tuesday night against Sam Houston State. Yeah, just having that, those those bats up and down the lineup, one through nine, just uh, powerful bats, just allowing the Texas offense to take off and uh, keep going. Last year was a little bit top heavy. This year it seems to be a little bit different, a little more balanced. James? Yeah, I agree with a lot of what Jake was saying about the hitting. I think the pitching has been a pleasant surprise for the Longhorns too so far. You know, going to Lafayette, taking two out of three there, winning the series against Purdue. Uh, a lot of big performances out of Bryce Elder, uh, a lot of the young guys, too, that got in there. Blair Hanley, a little rocky start, um, but I think he's going to figure it out as time comes. He's a veteran guy, um, and I think he'll, he'll turn it around as the season comes on. But a lot of the freshmen, Matt Whalen, had some nice innings there on Sunday uh, against Purdue, got in five scoreless innings, I think it was. So a uh, good outing for him, and it's nice to see some freshmen making an early impact for the Longhorns. Yeah, seeing these young guys come in and contribute right away is uh, really big for Texas this year. Uh, Matt, you starting off with one point. Jake and James, you each got two. So your first two points of college crossfire. But we're moving on to this weekend. Texas begins probably the toughest slate of games in all of college baseball when second-ranked LSU comes to town. What are your expectations for this three-game series this weekend? Y'all can jump in at any point in time now. Well, I, I expect it to be a, a pretty competitive series, of course. I mean, obviously welcoming in the number one team in the nation, a team like LSU, who's pretty well known around uh, not just the college baseball world, but the sports world, LSU baseball, uh, you know, great program over there in Baton Rouge. And they've got, it looks like their pitching so far has been a little rocky this year. So, uh, you know, look for Texas hitters to get out in front early. Uh, and really give the Longhorn pitchers a little cushion to work with uh, in, in a couple of these games this weekend. Yeah, going off of that, I, for this weekend, the number one thing I expect is runs. Uh, this LSU pitching staff has been hittable, especially the bullpen. 
Um, but you look at the LSU offense, they've slugged nine home runs already this season, whereas Texas has given up zero. So something's got to give there. That's, what, that's something I'm going to be looking to see. These young pitchers, as James just mentioned, um, Whalen and Elder, going up against these experienced power hitters for LSU, and that's going to be the most intriguing thing for me about this series. Like overall, I think it's gonna be a great matchup. Um, nothing, they, not taking anything away from LSU, but they haven't really played anyone this year. They're all smaller schools, undefeated, ten runs a game. That's gonna change this weekend against Texas. Last year, Texas went into Baton Rouge, won one out of three. This year's gonna be different. They're gonna win two out of three games. They have the advantage hidden wise. Um, actually, no, LSU has the advantage hidden wise. Um, UT has the advantage pitching wise. So it's gonna be a good matchup. Texas is going to end up on top, 2-3. Yeah, I think Texas, they have a really good shot uh, to take down a very strong a very strong LSU team. Yeah, the pitching for LSU has been a little underwhelming this year. Yeah. Um, I mean, you've got their, their starting pitcher on Friday giving up about five and a half runs per game. So Texas, if they can capitalize on that, should really make things interesting this weekend. So Matt, uh, you got another two points. Jake and James, another two points as well. So it's currently three, four, four. One of the biggest surprises, for me at least, was seeing Bryce Elder get the Friday starts ahead of Blair Henley these last two weekends. He then promptly pitched two gems while Henley's been up and down. And freshman Coy Cobb has had his moments as well. Now, do you have confidence in this rotation, or should Texas start to experiment with other guys pitching, uh, starting these weekend series? Like they've been successful with this rotation. Then you add Matt Whalen in there, and they have a capable bullpen that has played really well backing them up. So they should just stay with what they're doing. If someone starts slipping, then I think you should start changing up. But right now, they're solid. Yeah, I'm gonna say I'm I'm cautiously optimistic about this rotation. Um, I think you know based on just the early returns, which you can't always judge a full season by, um, but based on what we've seen so far, um, a couple of moments have given me you know, real encouragement about this rotation. The first was seeing uh, Matt Whalen, first off, come in against Lafayette with the inherited runners, letting them score in a game that the Longhorns would eventually drop on the road. Then coming back at home, going on the mound against Purdue, and working his way out of jam, scattering hits over five scoreless innings. So that gives me encouragement from him, watching that young pitcher uh, make that leap earlier in the season. And then there was Cobb, who had the really um, jittery first start as a, as a true freshman, but then pitched an absolute gen the last time out. Yeah, and on that that subject of the freshman pitchers, too, we saw Cole Quintanilla, another freshman, get some time over the weekend against Purdue and really look good, shut a, a good Purdue team, a Big Ten baseball team down for the most part. Uh, and, you know, that's going to be a big story moving forward. Uh, you know, getting closer to like regionals and the end of the season, when, how these freshmen develop, and if they'll be confident enough when their their number is called toward the end of the year, uh, and in regionals to come in and contribute uh, and offer the Longhorns some some valuable innings down the line uh, that they'll probably need come Big 12 play uh, and toward the end of the season in regionals. Yeah, I think just this having this pitching depth, the way that it's gone so far this season. Yes, there have been some struggles. Uh, in the Louisiana Lafayette game and then against Purdue, but there have been a lot more ups than downs so far this season as a whole. So, Matt, you're now up to five points, Jake six, James five. Moving on, one of the biggest tasks for Texas this season was to replace Cody Clemens, one of the best players in the country last year. So, who do you think is set to replace him this year? There's a lot of options to choose from, but who do you think will fill his shoes uh, most admirably? So I think it has to be Zach Zubia. He's been playing pretty well this season, has a few home runs. I think he had one tonight. Um, and you look at the stats last year, Clemens obviously had the most home runs, most RBIs, but right behind him on the list was Zubia. So I think this is the year, this is the year he steps up and takes that like, number one hitter role. So he's going to be um, not as great as Clemens was, but he's going to be the next man up. Yeah, for me, there's an obvious guy I would point to here, and that's uh, Austin Todd. Um, here you have a guy that wasn't a regular player last year, Scrapped his way to only about 16 hits last season. This year he's got 13 hits in nine games, and he's hitting third in the order. Absolutely seeing the ball huge right now, hitting at an absurd 371 clip through nine games. This is a guy that's really come out of nowhere and appears to be a budding star for this Texas team. Yeah, Todd is a guy I really like. You know, going with that whole outfield for the Longhorns, you got Duke Ellis uh, getting back, you know, being 100% healthy. Austin Todd, Eric Kennedy, another young guy. Uh, offered some valuable contributions on offense for Texas. I also have loved what I've seen from Bryce Regan. Uh, not a big kid, but at shortstop, holding his own, 
filling in for David Hamilton, uh, their star shortstop that actually tore his ACL prior to the season, uh, which a lot of people I think thought was going to be a big loss. But so far, Regan has held his own, and we even saw him uh, knock a, a pitch out of the park over the weekend. So showing a lot of pop as well. Yeah, Texas has, definitely has a lot of players that could fill uh, his role, Cody Clemens' role from last year. But I think it's going to be, I really think it's Austin Todd from what he's shown so far. But still liked your points about Zubia, Regan. Uh, so y'all are all tied up at seven uh, right now. So last question, real quick, how do you see Texas finishing this stretch of games against LSU, Stanford, Tech, TCU, and Arkansas? Would you say that they finish, go over 500 in these games or under 500 or even? A little over 500. A little over 500, okay. I'm going over 500 as well. All righty. Yeah, I think over 500 too. I think we're going to probably go to Stanford, and I really think we, we could take two out of three up there. Over so, 500. Yeah. I like that. I think they're probably going to be just at 500, if not a game or two below. I just think that this, this schedule is just super, super tough, and it's just going to set up a little bit more nicely uh, the second half of the season. So none of y'all are getting points to finish us out. That's it for now. When we return, we're talking about the possibility of LeBron missing the playoffs this year. And could there be a strike in the MLB on the horizon? Stick around. Welcome back to College Crossfire. Let's remind everybody of the score at home. Everybody's got seven. It's all tied up. Still anybody's game. Texas basketball took on Oklahoma this past Saturday without their leading scorer in Kerwin Roach. Texas started off slow, but eventually clawed its way back before falling short in the end. Roach has been suspended indefinitely, but Shaka hasn't ruled out the possibility of a return this season. Until the decision is made, however, Texas will have to try and make the tournament without one of their key players. So how does losing a player like Kerwin impact the rest of this season? For Texas, let's start with Matt. So obviously, like him being the leader in points and the senior leader, he's it's going to be a big loss. That's why they lost against Oklahoma. I thought they were going to like lose the next four games, but right now they're up 16. Baylor on the road, Burbs, Jace Fersman going off, Kurt, Courtney Ramey, um, Royce Ham. And it's time for the young freshmen and sophomores to step up and fill Kerwin's role because it's going to be helpful for next year when he's gone. Yeah, those young freshmen are definitely taking on a much larger role now that Kerwin is out, and Dylan Osikowski is also out of this game as well, so it makes the burden for them that much larger. Jake? Right, and you, you talk about the burden faced by the freshmen, and you know inevitably when you have a young team, like we've seen with this Texas team all year, they struggle to play a complete game. And so I think when you lose Roach, you lose your senior leader that would be a go-to guy in those moments, like such as the first half of the Oklahoma game on Saturday, where there's defensive lapses everywhere, nobody can get open shots, nobody can penetrate into the paint. I think having Roach was almost like a safety valve. You would see them go to him in those situations time and time again. And so I think that eventually not having Roach is going to rear its head and be problematic for this Texas team. Yeah, I think people really underestimate what it's like to have just that leadership, that guy who can step into that leadership role when things aren't going right gather the troops and refocus and uh, go again. James? Yeah, definitely. And building off of that, too, what y'all were just saying about having Roach out there, a veteran leader in some of these games down the stretch, key Big 12 games where the Longhorns really need these wins in order to improve their March Madness resume. Not having a guy like Roach on the floor really puts a lot of pressure on Shaka to get his guys, his young guys, mentally ready to finish strong in these games. So really – in addition to that, it puts a lot of pressure on guys like Matt Coleman, Jace Fabrice, Elijah Mitchell Long, some of these perimeter shooters to start making shots because Roach really has been one of their most consistent shooters and not having him in the lineup really puts pressure on those other guys. Yeah, James, I like what you said about how him not being there affects everybody else around him, especially the, the guys on the perimeter, Elijah Mitchell Long, mm -hmm. uh, Courtney Ramey, and uh, Matt Coleman. I mean, you don't have that steady score necessarily, so yes. having him out is a big blow for Texas. So you're getting the point. Moving on, the Los Angeles Lakers, well, what can we say about them? One day they're beating teams like the Celtics and the Rockets, and the next they're losing to teams like the Pelicans and the Grizzlies. They currently sit in 11th place in the West, three games behind the Spurs for the last playoff spot, and in fact they have about a 3% chance to make the playoffs. So who's responsible for their recent struggles? Is it Luke Walton? Is it Magic? LeBron, who? I mean, I don't know. Jake? 
Well, I, I don't think it's Luke Walton because an NBA coach really can, can only do so much. Um, I think it's a combination of things. Uh, sort of the, the lurking variable here is the injuries. Because you look at a team that, you know, was really competing in the Western Conference before you had injuries to LeBron James, Lonzo Ball, um, and other contributors. But in the end, if I had to pick from one of those three, I would say Magic, because this team is simply not built to compete with the big boys in the West just yet. You look at Golden State, Houston, and the, the Lakers don't have the similar amount of talent to those teams. And seeing this Lakers team on the floor right now almost makes me wonder if this is what LeBron's Cavs team from last year would have looked like if they had to play a Western Conference schedule. Um, right now, the supporting cast isn't there around him, uh, around LeBron James, that is. So, yeah, he hasn't had that, that supporting cast uh, that he has in recent years. Matt, were you going to say something? 100% LeBron's fault. Like, he's one of the greatest of all times, and like, nothing <laughs> against him. But the stats prove wherever LeBron goes, like, the team does better, but the players suffer. When he went to Miami, Chris Bosh's stats went down. When Kevin Love came to Cleveland, his stats went down. It's Le a LeBron-focused team. The Lakers have a young core, and they were doing decent. They, they were doing good last year. The team wasn't doing good, but the young guys putting up points. Once LeBron brought in his, brought in his boys on um, um, Rondo, McGee, they they're not got like they're not holding up their weight. So it's LeBron's fault. He's trying to build the team, especially with the Anthony Davis um, situation. Hundred percent LeBron. Yeah, just a lot going on, and he's missed some time too. So that hasn't helped matters at all. James, what do you think? Yeah, I think that those are all valid points. And again, on on the injuries, we know those have crept up on the Lakers, and it's tough for them playing in a place like Los Angeles. The spotlight is even bigger on them. So it's really important, I think, for L.A. down the stretch to kind of block out all the outside noise and just play their game. Because like we've seen back in, I think it was December, they were looking at a projected six seed in the Western Conference playoffs. So if they get back to playing their game, they can play their way back into the playoffs and they control their own destiny and have some really good players on that team, some good veteran presences mixed with a lot of uh, exciting young players. So we've seen them at their best, and so hopefully they can find that again coming up. So, but who's, who do you think is most at fault here? I think it's a combination of things, like Jake said. I don't think anyone's truly single-handedly at fault, but I think playing, being a Laker, playing for the Lakers, there's a lot of uh, drama and spotlight, and when things aren't going right, people start pointing fingers, and uh, I think that they're dealing with a lot of that outside noise right now, but just stick to playing basketball and they should be good. They've got a good team. They do have a so. good team. They're just young and inexperienced, but some of them I, I feel don't necessarily fit. So I'm going to have to agree with Jake at this point. I think it's a little bit of Magic's fault. He just hasn't put the, the right players around LeBron yet. There's still time, but I don't think he's done it yet. So, Jake, you're getting the point. We're moving on. The MLB offseason has been pretty slow these last few years as star players try to hold out for longer contracts. Manny Machado only just recently signed, and Bryce Harper has yet to sign anywhere. Last year was the same, with top stars looking for mega deals, even into spring training before eventually signing. The MLB has only had eight work stoppages, with the last one coming in 94 and 95. So just how close is Ma uh, Major League Baseball to a strike? James, I'll start with you. You know, I don't think they're, they're really that close. I mean, I honestly think these are rare circumstances. Guys like Machado and Harper are just... In other sports, too, we see guys getting paid, you know, a lot more than baseball players have traditionally been paid. And I think there is a lot of people say, you know, it's all about the money, and it's true. It really is. And, you know, for a guy like Harper, you know, he, he has a better shot, and even Machado, than, you know, playing for, like, the Padres or some of these other teams that have been tossed around at winning a championship, uh, making the playoffs. So I really – I don't think we're close to a strike. I think it's just some rare – cases just some rare cases matt what do you think just like he said it's only a few players that are holding out they want their mega deals that's fine but while they're holding out it gives younger stars a chance to like get the spotlight play well and eventually build themselves up to superstar status okay Jake? Uh, i'm gonna have to disagree with you guys here i'm gonna say that we're definitely closer to a strike than we have been at any point since the last one and that's because of the discussion of these past two off seasons of you know possible collusion regarding um, owners sort of lowballing these uh, these free agents. Um, the only thing I would mention here is that once one big domino falls in this offseason, such as a Bryce Harper or a Dallas Keuchel, we might see the other ones fall, especially because they all have the same agent. Jonathan. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna have to go with Matt and James. I don't think we're all that close to a strike yet. It could happen if this trend keeps up the way that it's going, but 
I don't think we're there just yet. So Matt and James, you're getting the point uh, to take us to break. So that's it for now. We've got rapid fire up gotcha. next. Stick around. Welcome back to College Crossfire. It's time for Rapid Fire, but let's go ahead and remind everybody of the score. We've got Matt with eight, Jake with eight, and James leading the way with nine. It's still anyone's game because in Rapid Fire, each question is worth two points, and you can jump in at any time. So Formula One libraries have been released with just a few weeks before the start of the 2019 season. Each team ends up having one, and while some are pretty consistent year in and year out, others like to change things up. Overall, they all look pretty cool, but if you had the opportunity to design your own library, what would it look like? And you can jump in at any time. I guess to make it blue, throw some sports team logos on like the Giants, Rockets, Yankees, just something, I don't know. I don't follow enough F1. Don't follow enough <laughs> F1. Okay. All right. There we go. Uh, Jake, James? I mean, it's funny. I don't know. I, I My default is maybe some flames because I remember playing with Hot Wheels as a kid. <laughs> there and, we go. And a lot of the cool cars had flames on them, so I guess that equates to speed, so we'll go with flames. Oh, you always need some flames if you want to go fast. That's I mean, right. that's, that's kind of the, you the rule fast, for speed. Yeah, you're not first, you're last. That's so right. That's exactly. Going for right here. Exactly. <laughs> Jake? Yeah. Well, if you're thinking speed, you're thinking cheetahs, fastest animal, I'm thinking put it along the side. You've got... You've got the like cheetah that. skin along the side. You've got four legs, as in the four turbo engines above each wheel. It's Ooh. cohesive. It has a theme. It says speed. Nothing better. I kind of like that. I, I really like the flames, but I mean, I like the cheetah with the with the turbo over the wheels uh, for the four legs. I think that's pretty cool. I mean, that is sorry. Like, Fire the point. is yeah. definitely it's definitely definitely I fast. Say, the cheetah. Yeah. Respect on that. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit yeah. faster. Everyone loves Ricky their Bobby's. <laughs> So, Jake, you're yeah. getting the two points. Moving on, the AAF made headlines this past weekend. Not for anything that happened during a game, but rather during a halftime performance. During halftime at the Apollos game, a dog set the world record for the longest Frisbee catch at 83 yards. Now, what would you schedule for some halftime entertainment during an AAF game if you got the opportunity? Well, I'm going to go with a tried-and-true formula. It's a favorite of UT students. It's a favorite of college basketball fans around the world, and I think it's big enough to make the national stage in the AAF, Red Panda. Now, you watch Red Panda, everyone's skeptical at first. What is she, what is, what is going on? It's, she's on a unicycle, flipping plates from her foot to on top of her head, and so she starts with one bowl on top of her head, flips two, then three, then four, then five. Everyone in the stadium is on their feet by the end, um, and it's, it, it's a spectacle, and it would be it would bring people to the AAF games. I've seen they need some more attendance. But how would that work with the with the turf or the grass on the on the unicycle? Wouldn't that make it a little more difficult for her to even perform? Adds to the spectacle. I have full Adds confidence that Red spectacle. Panda. I have full confidence that Red Panda can do it. All right, Red Panda. She's the a bar national has been celebrity. Set. So yeah. <laughs> Um, James, yeah, Matt? I, you know, I love a good old obstacle course, so you know, I don't know about y'all, but you know, just throwing stuff out there. We get some hula hoops and you know, all kinds of, you know, maybe a rope course, I don't know, something something just for, you know, all ages to kind of enjoy and, you know, just kind of, I don't know, mix it up. Something you don't see as, as often anymore. So you're going to bring but, some fans from the stands to do an obstacle yeah, course on yeah, the field? exactly. Okay, okay, Matt? So we've seen this in college basketball, regular basketball, baby races. Baby races. Okay. It's a long way for yeah. a baby. Yeah, how far are you going to make a <laughs> baby <laughs> crawl? Not like the whole 100 That's yards, but going the across or like 10 yards, I don't know. Okay, okay. I think that could work if you shorten the distance a little bit, yeah. like 10, maybe 15 yards. I like that. It's entertaining. It's cute. It brings that, that just appeal. So, right. Matt, you're getting the two points. And the la final rapid fire of the night, former Kansas State John Weifold has proposed a wild idea, a Big 12 and Pac-12 alliance in football. Every team from the Big 12 would have three non-conference games against the Pac-12 and vice versa for the Pac-12. No more FCS games. No more group of five games. Just higher quality football, for the most part. Sorry, UCF. <laughs> Knowing that, if you could create an alliance between any two conferences or leagues, which two would it be and why? Big 12 and SEC, because everybody wants to see Texas against A&M again, and no, two schools don't want it, like the president of A&M doesn't want to do it, so force them to do it. Let's see UT versus A&M again. All right, got to force uh, Texas and Texas A&M back together. Okay. I'm thinking Big 10 and SEC. 
So often you hear these conferences compared as having a similar style of, of, of gritty, tough football. So which one can do it better? I think it'd be interesting to watch that unfold. All right, Big Ten, SEC. I really yeah. like those. I, I kind of like Pac-12 versus anyone, just getting the Pac-12 a little more airtime and seeing some of the teams that normally when we're falling asleep in our beds at night, they're kicking off. So maybe yeah. getting getting them more coverage and, you know, Pac-12, SEC, Pac-12, Big just, 12. Just seeing the Pac-12 in general would be interesting because, right. like you said, we don't necessarily get the opportunity to do that. But I'm going to have to go with Jake getting the two points and the win Big Ten, oh SEC, they have been the premier conferences uh, in recent recent memory. So you're getting the two points. You're getting the win. Do we have time for FaceTime? We do have time for FaceTime, so take it away. Well, I'm going to take today's FaceTime to reach out to a dear friend, Bryce Harper. I've grown up a Nationals fan as hard as it's been, watching you lose time and time again in elimination games, which you somehow find a way to lead but still lose. So Bryce Harper, come home to DC. We have a great team waiting for you. I promise the bullpen won't blow it this time. <laughs> That's all I got. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to disagree with that. He's not coming back. To back <laughs> home. Uh, Sorry, that, no, I don't think that's happening. Not this year, not this time. That's all the time that we have for tonight. Congratulations to our winner, Jake Herman. Make sure to tune in to our sister show, College Press Box, on Mondays at 9.30 p.m. And be sure to join us again next Wednesday at 9. Don't forget to follow at TSTV Sports on social media. And for all the panelists and everyone in studio and master control, I'm Jonathan Pulasic. Have a wonderful evening. Oh, <laughs>